welcome to Calvary Chapel of White Mountains and another of our uh, nearly empty uh, COVID-19 uh, era services. Uh, and we hope that uh, you are being blessed that uh, uh, you are being fed and growing in your walk with the Lord. Uh, these challenging times definitely uh, are times when we can, uh, can really draw near the Lord in, in a way that, uh, uh, that we might not be able to do or, or maybe it was harder to do before. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people like to go to retreats. And uh, a lot of times people are very blessed at retreats. But one of the things that are different about retreats is that you're out of the norm. You, you are breaking from your normal daily routine and, and you're there just able to focus on the Lord and what he would say to you. Uh, I would encourage you. Use this time that you have where uh, you're not in your normal routine. Use this time to do that, to draw close to the Lord. Spend extra time in prayer. Spend extra time in the study of the Word of God. Do, do what you can uh, <laughs> while you can't do much of anything else. Uh, don't let this be a wasted time of just sitting and watching a lot of TV and, and, and complaining about what's going on. But let's make the best of it and uh, really uh, get stronger in the Lord through this whole thing. So uh, open your Bibles with me, please, if you would, to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 13. And let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. And we know that no matter what happens in this world, Lord, that you are still God. You are still our Savior. You're still with us. Your hand is still upon us, Lord, and we will still see you one day face to face. And help us, Lord. Help us to hear from you this morning that we would be challenged, that we would be corrected if need be. Uh, Father, that we would receive from you through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit to help to conform us into the image of your son, Father. Lord, bless this time now that we spend in your word. And we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. The title of today's teaching is Nothing Just Happens. Have you ever noticed how people uh, don't like to take responsibility for their bad decisions or their bad actions? Uh, I used to race bicycles. And uh, back in the day, I was a full-time truck driver, but uh, I took a part-time job at a bicycle shop to pay for my habit. That is my habit of needing bikes and parts and stuff like that. Never took a paycheck home. Always, always took it in trade with bikes and parts and all that. But working in the shop, uh, we, we used to joke about a couple of phrases that we would hear customers use to try and get us to pay for their mistakes. One of the things, and I don't know how somebody came up with it, but we heard it over and over again was, I was just riding regular and then all of a sudden, <laughs> and then they'd show us all kinds of, of crazy things, like a front wheel that was in the shape of a Pac-Man, you know, <laughs> along with uh, some, some concrete from a curb inside that crease and, and some cuts on both sides of the, of the tire. And you'd ask, well, did you hit a curb or something? Oh, no, I was just riding along. And this happened. <laughs> or they'd bring their bike in and the front wheel would look like a taco and the fork would be bent back. The frame was bent and, and you'd ask them, well, what did you hit? Oh, I didn't hit anything. I was just riding along and this just happened. And every now and then, one of their friends would come in and tell us what really happened. We knew that they weren't just JRA. That was the, the abbreviation that we gave to it, just riding along. They were JRA, <laughs> or just riding regular, as some of them would say. We, we knew that wasn't the case. Metal doesn't just happen to bend without a cause. New tires don't all of a sudden get cuts on both sides without something causing it. But people are so resistant to accepting responsibility 
for their mistakes that they will make up all kinds of crazy stories or they'll lie or, or whatever, or they deny that they had anything to do with it. And the same thing goes in the spiritual realm. So often I will hear people say, I don't know what happened. I was doing great with the Lord. Then all of a sudden I was just, I, I was sinning. All of a sudden I found myself you know, living this life of sin. That's never the case. There's always factors that lead up to someone falling into sin. And we'll see that today in 2 Samuel 13. And it's a very disgusting <laughs> account that's recorded in the Bible. But this chapter is part of the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah that was prophesied by Nathan the prophet back in 2 Samuel chapter 12. But before we go any further in thinking about this as being some of the consequences, understand, just because God allows something doesn't mean that He condones or excuses sin. Paul makes that point in Romans chapter 9. Uh, God allowed Pharaoh to uh, come to power, knowing uh, that Pharaoh would resist God's will. And in Romans 9, 17, Paul writes, For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may de be declared in all the earth. See, God commanded Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh should have let them go. But God knew what kind of leader this man would be. So God raised up a sinful, proud, and stubborn man who would refuse to obey in order to show his power in, in making Pharaoh let him go, in delivering the people of Israel from Egypt. God knew what he'd do, but Pharaoh was still accountable for his actions. And God judged Pharaoh and Egypt for their disobedience and for their treatment of God's people. See, we are all responsible for our actions and our intentions. Never forget that. So first, let's start with verse 1, and we'll get the cast of characters in this account. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now, Amnon was David's eldest son through David's wife, Ahinoam. And she was from Jezreel, a town uh, in Israel uh, that was of the tribe of Issachar. Absalom was David's third-born son and his sister Tamar. They were both uh, from David's wife, Maaka. She was the daughter of a Gentile named Talmai, who was the king of Geshur. And it seems that David had apparently picked up the custom of that time of marrying daughters of a foreign king to ensure peace with that kingdom. Now, remember our title, Nothing Just Happens. The kings of Israel were commanded by God not to multiply wives. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, we read, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Had David obeyed this command, Absalom and Tamar would not have existed, and none of this that we're about to read could have happened. Now, we're told that Amnon loved his half-sister Tamar. The word in, in the Hebrew there for, for love has a very wide usage. And here, as we'll see, it's, it's nothing like the agape love described in 1 Corinthians 13. This is very different. This is actually lust. And those are the primary characters in this account and the root problem. Abnon has an inordinate desire or lust for his beautiful half-sister half Tamar. Now here's more of the problem in verse 2. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. I find that's a pretty interesting choice of words. It was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. 
and this is one of those indicators that his, quote, love for her was actually lust and not real love. See, when it's love, you may do something with somebody. But lust, because it's focused on self, will do something to someone else. See, love gives, lust takes. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says about real agape love that love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. See, love does what's best for the other person, not whatever satisfies the carnal cravings of yourself. Amdon knew that it was improper for him uh, to have his sister, even though she was just his half-sister. In Deuteronomy 27, 22, it says, Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. And in Leviticus 18, 11, we're told the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father. She is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. <laughs> and that's exactly who Tamar was. His father's wife's daughter, begotten by his father, David. And Leviticus 20, verse 17 says, If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his guilt. See, Amnon knew that having sex with Tamar would be a wicked thing, as it says here. If she was consenting, they would both be cut off from society and God would not be pleased. But because of his lust, Amnon did not care. And you know, the same thing is true for today. The same thing happens today. How many young ladies have heard, well, if you love me, you'll let me. I think a good response from her should be, well, if you love me, you'll want what's best for me. You'll want to keep me pure. <laughs> that's, that's the best uh, answer for that one. See, sex between two people who are not married to each other or to anyone else is called fornication in the Bible. Fornication is sin. Sin separates a person from God. It causes a break in fellowship. Someone who really loves another person will want what's the very best for that person. They'll want what's right before God for them. See, if I love you, then I want what's best for you. And I know what's best for you is a right relationship with God, a close relationship with God. And so that's what I'll want for you. And I will do what it takes to see that, that whatever I could do is the best for you, whatever that may be. And certainly it would include keeping right with God, keeping purity and that. Lust, on the other hand, very different. Lust is only concerned about self, what it could take. Notice what we're told in this verse. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick. As we'll see in a minute, Amnon was so consumed with lusting over Tamar that he couldn't even eat. He was getting thinner and thinner. Amnon was distressed because he was obsessed. He was obsessed with his sister Tamar. Now, look at some of the things there in these two verses that were swirling around in Amnon's mind all day and all night. She was lovely. She was a virgin. No man had ever had her, and he wanted her badly, but couldn't have her because it was improper. There was no way around what the law said. No way she would consent to it. See, he knew that she was a good girl, and we'll see that. This was a lot like when the devil tempted Eve. Remember when he tempted her with the forbidden fruit? 
After all the arguments from the devil, why she should eat the forbidden fruit, we're told in Genesis 3, 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. See, Eve saw that the tree was good for food. Folks, that's called the lust of the eyes. And that's Amnon's problem right here. He saw that she was lovely, pleasant to look at. And like that fruit would be good for food, it would satisfy Eve's crazy cravings. That's the lust of the flesh. See, Amnon saw Tamar as someone who would be good to have, someone that could really satisfy his cravings. And like we said, nothing just happens. Nothing. Just as the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, it's common. What Eve and Adam was tempted with in the garden are the same things that you and I are tempted with. They're the same things that anybody is tempted with. But any time temptation comes our way, God is always faithful to give us a way of escape. And Amnon's way of escape, what he should have done to get out of the sin of lust and to keep himself from further sin would have been to focus his thinking elsewhere. In Philippians 4, 8, we're told, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, <clears throat> meditate on these things. See, Amnon should have meditated or filled his mind with things that would have fit this list. <clears throat> Maybe he should have focused his thinking on work. Hey, how can I help my dad to run the kingdom? Yeah, maybe I better get busy with that. Or even a hobby. <laughs> you know, Amnon could have, could have picked up a hobby or something like that and focused on that. Or maybe he could have uh, maybe focused on looking for a wife, one that would meet his physical needs legitimately, and he could meet her needs kind of thing. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do any of those things. Instead, he does something worse. Look at verses 3 through 6. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. Now Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, Why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Amnon laid down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came in to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. Nothing just happens. Amnon had set himself up for trouble in this situation by having a very crafty man, a very ungodly man, such as Jonadab, as his close friend. We're warned in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Don't be deceived. Folks, who you hang out with will influence you, whether they're good or bad. Another thing Amnon did was he set himself up to sin by taking counsel from an ungodly man. We're told in the very first Psalm, Psalm 1 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. A good friend, <laughs> if it was really a good friend uh, to Amnon, would have given him good counsel. 
Like, he, he would have responded, like, what? You got the hots for your sister? Gross, dude. <laughs> Come on. Get out of there. Stop thinking of her. <laughs> Get her out of your head. Stay away from her, man. Do whatever you can. Fill your mind up with something else. Man, you're, you're being perverse, man. <laughs> but he didn't do that. But it really is that way. You know, good people will give you good counsel. Like the counsel Paul told the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, don't set yourself up to fall. Get out of there. Flee. Do like Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. Run, Forrest, run. Get out of there. We're told in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Amnon made provisions to sin. He accepted the advice of his buddy and cousin Jonadab, and then he implemented that plan. Look at verses 7 through 11. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was lying down. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and placed them out before him. But he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into my bedroom, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon her brother in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. I mean, you talk about making provisions to sin. I mean, that's total setup. And you, you look at that and go, good grief. <laughs> Come on, David. You're no rookie at all of this nonsense. Yeah, you know, you've been around the block. Why would you do that? Why would you help set this whole thing up like this? You know, she makes him those special cakes. That might have been. It might have been that, that her cakes were, were famous, like my wife's chocolate chip cookies. You know, anybody who's eaten those, oh yeah. You know, and if her cakes were that good, you know, that might have been why David went along with it. Oh yeah, yeah. She, he'll smell that, those cakes bacon, and, and, and no one can resist them. You know, he'll eat her cakes, yeah, even if he doesn't have an appetite, and he'll start to get better. Well, she brings them in and sets them on a table outside his room there. Probably on a table. I don't think she set them on the floor. <laughs> then he has all of his servants go out, asked her into his room so she could feed him, leaving them alone in the bedroom. Nothing just happens. How often do people fall into sin by doing something very similar to this? Come over for dinner. No one else is at home. And after dinner, you get, get comfy on the couch. You know, kick off your shoes. And maybe, you know, she slips into something more comfortable. <laughs> and they cuddle up in a blanket, start making out. And, you know, if one of them does not get out of there, they're toast. They're going to fall. They're going to get into sin. So there's Amnon in his bed. He's got a hold of his sister Tamar. No one else is around. Now's his chance to fulfill his lust, to fulfill all the things that he's been fantasizing about. Come, lie with me, my sister. Verses 12 and 13. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I... Where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. This poor girl is in a situation that she never expected to be in. I mean, he's her brother. She's got no idea what's been going on in his mind. 
She tries reasoning with her attacker, even suggesting that he talk to their dad, the king, that, so that he could give her to him, that he could have her in a legitimate way. And by the way, I don't, I don't believe that she thought that would work. I, I believe she knew David wouldn't go along with that, but I, I believe she was saying that, uh, he kind of given it as a, a shot to get Amnon to let her go. But it didn't work. Verse 14, however, he would not heed her voice, and being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. So Amnon raped his sister Tamar. But look what happens afterwards. Verses 15 through 19. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out, away from me, and bolt the door behind her. Now she had <clears throat> on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying. Amnon, being obsessed with Tamar, unwilling to control his thoughts, to take his thoughts captive, his lust driving him to rape her, he thought that having her would be so good that it would be all, oh, yeah, everything that I've ever wanted. But just like any other sin, it's often only after it's all over do you see the ugliness of your sin. And what you obsessed over before is now repulsive to you. Folks, I've heard that over and over and over again. And how many women have felt that shame and wept bitterly after surrendering herself to a man's lust, only to have the door bolted behind her after she's been thrown out. Okay, maybe not a literal bolting of the door, but being shut out of his life after having that one night stand. Today they call it ghosting where he stops calling or texting or coming over, stops taking her calls or returning her calls or text. Uh, he's completely removed from her life. Now, the rest of the chapter, I, I encourage you to read it later because the ugliness isn't over. But folks, just to sum this whole thing up, look back at, at everything and understand, folks, nothing just happens. Be careful who you date. <laughs> Be careful who you're thinking about. Be careful who, who you allow your mind to go over and over again. I've heard so many affairs that have happened where a couple of people are working together in the same office or whatever, in the same proximity, and they start thinking about each other in a wrong way. Nothing just happens, folks. Be careful not to set yourself up for any kind of sin. Take your thoughts captive. Surround yourself with good and godly friends. Friends that will give you the right counsel. Friends that, that won't go along with your sin. And don't make it easy to fall into sin. In fact, make it hard. Make it very hard to sin. Because nothing just happens. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have included in your word even something as hard to read as, as a rape against a sister. But Lord, in this account, Lord, you have shown us what we can do to keep ourselves out of sin. Father, I pray for each and every person who has heard this, Lord, that they would take it to heart. Lord, that uh, even now, especially in, in this time of so much free time, 
where our minds can wander, where we can go places in our minds that we ought not to. Lord, that you would help all of us to take our thoughts captive. Help all of us to, to meditate on the things in Philippians 4 8, those kind of things. Those things that are good and true and lovely and pure, noble, good report, those kind of things. Help us, Lord. Help us, Father, to, to seek you, to, to really follow hard after you. And Lord, that we would not allow the, the temptations of the enemy, no matter how crafty he is or cunning he is, uh, no matter what he does to present these things to us to stumble into, that we would not allow ourselves to give thought to those things, even, even for a moment. Help us, Lord. Help us to understand that nothing just happens. Lord, that we can do those things that would, that would cause us to be drawn closer to you, to be more Christ-like. And in doing so, Lord, we'd be less likely to sin. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.